This documentary will be different from the ones we have done on the other ten nations and peoples in our documentary series. When we spoke of Prussia, Byzantium, Ireland, we focused on specific events, specific figures, names, movements, decisions, moments. Here, however, each of these things are in short supply, or at least legible records of them are. Some records were left, but we cannot yet decipher them. No doubt, an incredible story unfolded here on the island of Crete in the Mediterranean Sea, today a part of Greece, in very ancient history, yet the heroes, villains, and common people of this civilization have disappeared, leaving behind only clues and traces of their past which we must piece together in order to understand them. Thankfully, they have left us a number of exciting and incredible remains which have allowed researchers to understand the nearly legendary people who once dwelled here better than what one might imagine. They were the first Europeans to form an advanced civilization. They left behind wondrous cities, artwork, writing which may have occasionally been produced with a Bronze Age version of a printing press, multi-story buildings and palaces, sewer systems, and much more. They clearly had a complex network of cities and trade extending throughout the Aegean Sea and beyond. They achieved many things not equaled in the rest of Europe for ages. In fact, their golden age began a thousand years before the village of Rome was even founded. As impressive as these people were, we don't know their names. They disappeared and remained buried for ages, forgotten until only recently. Not only can we not read their writing, but, apart from vague references from other peoples like the ancient Egyptians and later stories from the ancient Greeks, they are scarcely mentioned by others. Historians have therefore given them a few names of their own. The ancient Cretans, the Aegean Empire, but the most common name is the one which comes from a famous king of the island from Greek mythology, the Minoans. Who were these people, and what happened to them? What can we learn from their success and their demise? If we could crack the codes of this lost civilization, could we mitigate or even prevent problems which we could one day face? Furthermore, by studying them, could we unveil the secret behind one of the most famous and mysterious ancient legends, the disappearance of Atlantis? Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to Fire of Learning. Thank you for joining us as we now add the Minoans to the list of nations and peoples whose history we have covered in our documentary series. Before we begin, I would like to thank TJ Horego, Gabriela Searle, Eric Coivisto, Chet the Man, Krista Bluesmith, Tom Blay or Blaze, Hunter Bowersox, Dino Smith, Cameron Lloyd, Nicholas Payne, DVK, and Bruce J. Frank for being our most recent supporters on Patreon. They join these supporters who make these videos possible. I'd also like to thank the gentleman who inspired me to make this video much sooner than I otherwise would have. Now then, let's get to it. In Greek mythology, Minos is regarded as a major king of Crete. He was one of three sons of Zeus and Europa. The tales associated with him seem to have been told around 8 to 700 BC, but almost certainly predate this, especially if the character and associated events are based upon real people. Minos lived in the city of Knossos with his adoptive father, the king, Asterion. When his father died, he was not immediately made king of Crete, however, and bickered with his two brothers over the right of kingship. Minos sought the ultimate proof of his right to rule, and prayed to Poseidon for a sign of divine approval. Poseidon obliged, and sent him a great bull which emerged from the sea, which he intended for Minos to sacrifice back to him. Minos displayed the bull to his people, who then recognized his kingship. He then exiled his brothers from the island when they continued to protest. The first half of the deal had been fulfilled, now it was time for Minos to repay the sea god. Here, however, he made a mistake. He was quite impressed with the bull that Poseidon had sent him, and tried to keep it and deceive the sea god by sacrificing another bull instead, hoping he wouldn't notice. However, Poseidon did indeed notice and was not at all happy with his trickery. To punish him, Poseidon placed a curse on Minos's wife, Pasiphae, causing her to become increasingly attracted to the bull. Long story short, Nine months later, Pasiphae had a child, not of Minos, but of the beast. 
a half-man, half-bull creature, which was to be known as the Bull of Minos, or in Greek, the Minotaur. Minos found himself unsure of what to do with the child, and eventually called upon the architect Daedalus to build a structure capable of containing the beast. Daedalus constructed a wonderfully complex maze, known as the Labyrinth, to contain the beast and prevent it from ever escaping. Minos had a son, one of his own, Androgeus, who was a star athlete. Around the same time as these events, Androgeus traveled to Athens to compete in a number of competitive games. While there, he performed remarkably, earning the jealousy of the Athenian competitors. These Athenian athletes went so far as to assassinate Androgeus. King Minos was quite naturally outraged and took immediate action. He gathered his army and sailed north to invade Athens. The Athenians stood no chance and were defeated, and in the peace agreement, Minos extracted a cruel tribute from them. It was agreed that every nine years, seven young men and seven virgin women were to be sent to Crete, to be sent into the labyrinth, to be fed to the Minotaur. This occurred two times, but on the third cycle, something strange happened. A brave young Athenian man by the name of Theseus volunteered to be a part of the tribute. His intention was to slay the beast, thereby liberating his people from this burden. When he arrived on Crete, he encountered the daughter of King Minos, Ariadne, who fell in love with him and sought to assist him on his noble quest. She obtained advice from the builder, Daedalus, who instructed Minos to traverse the labyrinth by tying a ball of linen on one end to the entrance and the other around his waist, so that he could follow it out when the deed was done. Eventually, Theseus encountered the beast and a great fight ensued. Using either his sword or his bare hands, the legends differ, he killed the beast and then escaped the labyrinth. It's a classic story of Greek mythology. One has to wonder, however, if there is any truth to it. Perhaps the Minotaur was a little bit fictional, but historians are interested in whether or not this Minos was based on a real king. They would not be surprised if it were so, as other events around this time, once thought of as pure myth, such as the Trojan War, may have had some basis in reality as well. The mythical king Minos may have been based on a real person, or the legends may refer to two separate kings. The word Minos may have even been a general word for king in the Minoan language. Some scholars have pointed out that it resembles the names of other legendary founder kings of ancient history, such as Menes of Egypt and Shraddhadeva Manu of India. It is also entirely possible that the mythical king Minos was not even a Minoan king, but rather a later Mycenaean king people whom we will discuss later. Regardless, it was after this character that, in 1900, the British archaeologist Sir Arthur Evans, who was key to the discovery of these people and their history, named the civilization which he distinguished from later civilizations present on the island. Regarding the facts, however, what do we know for certain, or at least suspect? Where do we start with this civilization? When did it begin? No one knows for certain when Minoan civilization began. The island had been inhabited for many thousands of years before the Minoan Golden Age. It is known, however, from multiple examinations that the ancient Minoans were genetically quite similar to the modern-day inhabitants of the island, as well as other Europeans, which is an important clue regarding their immediate origins. It is around the year 3500 BC that the earliest beginnings of Minoan civilization are present. This marks the beginning of what is known as the Pre-Palatial Period. The Palatial in Pre-Palatial refers to the amazing remains of palaces present on the island. The Pre-Palatial Period seems to have lasted for 1500 years, from 3500 BC to about 2000 or 1900 BC, though it has been dated to as far back as 7000 BC as well, where the earliest beginnings of civilization are present. The periods are defined by a number of different things, such as remains of differing pottery styles and architecture. The dating of 3500 BC was chosen because of its proximity to the beginning of the Bronze Age. Keep in mind, however, this is a debated subject, and there are different ways of defining the eras of this civilization. As the name suggests, this era was a period prior to the splendor of Minoan civilization, an era of foundation when early settlements spread across the island. It was in this time, around 3200 BC, that the aforementioned Bronze Age reached the Minoans. 
As the name suggests, this refers to a period marked by the use of bronze, which replaced copper and stone. Ironworking was not yet possible, and the Iron Age would not begin for another 2,000 years. The discovery and use of bronze led to an explosion throughout the Near East, allowing for improvements in war, agriculture, architecture, and many other areas of daily life. Alongside this transformation came many other early advances, such as writing and the wheel, probably not by coincidence. The beginnings of these things are seen in distant civilizations such as Sumer and Egypt, and would be present on Crete as well, though not until many centuries after these civilizations. The early Minoans seem to have been heavily influenced by those around them, such as the ancient Egyptians, with whom there is heavy evidence of trade and interaction. Take for example how Minoan artists portrayed these individuals. Do they remind you of Egyptian artwork? There was likely inspiration from them. The Egyptians would, much later on, speak of a place called Keftu, which may be a name for Crete derived from what the ancient Cretans called themselves, but we have no way of knowing. Scholars continue to wonder whether or not this reference was a very rare reference to this ancient people. It was over a thousand years later, around 2000 BC, that the Proto-Palatial, or Old Palace period began. This period ended around 1750 BC, with the beginning of what seems to be the Golden Age, or Neo-Palatial period. This period, broadly of 2000 BC to 1450 BC, was the one in which Minoan culture sprang up and truly flourished. It's easy to forget, when dealing with such ancient times about which so little is known, that that period, from 2000 BC to 1450 BC, lasted for 550 years. This amount of time is roughly equal to the amount of time between us and the Renaissance. Evidence shows notable advancement in Minoan civilization, with higher levels of social organization, and likely greater centralization of political and religious authority beginning around 2000 to 1900 BC. Not too long before, by around 2100 BC, the earliest forms of Minoan writing had appeared. These are referred to as the Cretan Hieroglyphs. They are the first European writing system, and likely descended from other similar forms of writing in Anatolia and the Levant. However, it is impossible to say what exactly the origin of the writing system is, as the ancestor of this writing system has been lost and the symbols are undeciphered as of 2020. A few centuries later, by around 1800 BC, Minoan writing evolved further into their famous Linear A script. The Cretan hieroglyphs and Linear A would coexist for some time, as is shown by contemporary remains of them found on clay tablets, though Linear A script is also, quite frustratingly, undeciphered. To understand what it is like to try to piece together a civilization's history without its writing, consider what we might think of the ancient Romans if Latin were a lost, undecipherable language. Furthermore, adding to this, consider what it would be like if we had, for the most part, only relatively recently discovered that the Romans even existed. We could rely solely on things like archaeology, DNA evidence, old legends, and things like this to understand them. There are a number of things which we could probably work out, such as the size of their domain and the level of their social organization, and other very broad things like that, but many of the details, the important stories, the key figures, Romulus, Caesar, Trajan, and things like that would be lost. Some things, perhaps forever. Now would be a good time to note also because of this, if you decide to look more into the Minoans after this presentation, my advice is to be a little bit careful. When I first started researching them, I remember running into different sources presenting contradictory things as facts, because the sources did not clarify enough that they were presenting mostly guesswork and speculation, and that we really aren't sure about a whole lot. Perhaps the person to go farthest off the deep end with his speculation was Sir Arthur Evans himself, actually, who very possibly damaged our understanding of the Minoans a little bit. We owe a great deal to him for his important discoveries here, but he also made a number of mistakes. When he restored a number of things, like the frescoes in the throne room of Knossos, he reconstructed them according to how he felt that they should have looked, and possibly made a number of mistakes in his reconstruction. The rules of archaeology at this time were still new, and so many mistakes that would not be made today were made. Anyway, 
It is worth pointing out, however, that even if we could uncover the meaning behind these mysterious Minoan symbols, much of it might not be that profound. Like with the Mycenaeans and some other very ancient civilizations, it could consist largely of trivial record-keeping, business and legal agreements, and things which would certainly be useful in a way, but not very elaborative. Bob purchased 15 goats from Joe on this day, that kind of thing. This linear A script would be used until about 1450 BC, when it was slowly replaced by the linear B script for reasons we will address later. The defining aspect of the protopalatial age was of course the construction of larger palaces around the island. There are three main palaces from around this time, Malia, Phaistos, and most famous of all, Knossos. More have been found over the past century which were founded over the centuries of Minoan history. These palaces are quite remarkable, especially for their time. As mentioned, there were multiple levels, and they featured impressive staircases, columns, and artwork along the walls. The palaces were, among many things, likely administrative centers, but no one is sure in what form. The word palace may not even be correct. They were referred to as palace temples by Evans, who, again, could not have been sure. The palaces may have actually been multi-purpose centers. It is clear they were storage areas, and they may have also been religious sites, as well as, possibly, partially, residential areas. As has been suggested, we don't know how the Minoan governments functioned at this time or for any of its history. The presence of throne rooms and the like suggests a complex hierarchy, but again, no one knows. The throne room may have been for a religious or ceremonial purpose, or even, some people have suggested, that priests and priestesses may have held a fair degree of political power. Kings were the norm in this age in places like nearby Egypt, but archaeologists have not uncovered any depictions of what they believe to have been a dominant authority figure, which are quite obvious in places like ancient Egypt. However, their artwork might portray nobility and servants. This would suggest, of course, social stratification. It has been suggested by some that women had prominent roles in society, possibly meaning a fair degree of equality and placement in administrative roles, but this is based off of their common presence and depiction in art alone. We would easily, incorrectly, come to the same conclusion about women in later Mycenaean society by judging them based off of their artwork alone. The Mycenaeans had prominent female deities, but were administered, on Earth, firmly by males. The palace at Knossos would become the largest of these palaces. At 20,000 square feet, it dwarfs the remains of other palaces found on the island. It was so intricate that it reminded Sir Arthur Evans of the mythical labyrinth of Greek mythology, which he believed did exist. It was not a labyrinth though, and no minotaur remains were ever uncovered, but the complexity of the structure may indeed have been a real inspiration for the legends. Knossos likely eventually became dominant on the island, though to what extent and of what this dominance consisted is not known. By the way, Knossos seems to be quite old, possibly old enough to be the first European city. It's uncertain if the Minoans ever united into one country over the many centuries of their culture's existence. Though they were clearly a connected society, shown not only by the shared cultural trends but a series of roads which connected the main settlements, and though their influence extended well beyond their own island, there are signs of the independence of the various cities. It is possible, judging by the locations of the later palaces, that eight distinct political entities arose on the island, and that different languages were even spoken in different parts of the island. Although, the lack of walls and major fortifications uncovered on the island, which we will discuss more later, might suggest that there were no threats from the land, meaning some kind of unity or cooperation. If there was a kind of unity, the center of their civilization would almost certainly have been Knossos. Perhaps the ruler of Knossos functioned as something like a high king, who held a degree of power over lesser but independent kings on the island, but that is again pure speculation. We don't even know if they had kings. By about 2000 BC, when the Minoan culture began to flourish, Knossos alone had an estimated population of about 18,000 people. The Neopalatial, or New Palace period, as mentioned, began around 1750 or 1700 BC. 
it would last until about 1450 or 1400 BC. This quite clearly seems to have been the Minoan Golden Age, though it began following what appears to have been a destruction of many of their palaces, possibly resulting from war or, much more likely, as the destruction was more widespread, a major earthquake or a natural disaster. The Minoans would rebuild their palaces, however, making them better than ever, hence the Neo in Neo-Palatial. The population of Knossos alone would grow to perhaps 100,000 by 1700 BC. Other palaces arose in Galatas and Zakros. To sustain this population, the Minoans developed advanced plumbing systems. Sewers to expel waste from their cities, aqueducts to bring water in, cisterns to store it, and clay filters to treat it. Their impressive infrastructure was maintained and repaired in the face of the aforementioned earthquakes, which rocked the island on numerous occasions. Another impressive discovery from around the 1700s BC was the Phaistos Disc, a disc of fired clay containing writing which seems to have been made by pressing prearranged seals into the clay, which may be indicative of a kind of very early printing press. They also had advanced forms of agriculture, growing a variety of fruits and vegetables. They domesticated numerous animals, like bees, goats, and cattle. As might have been suggested by the tale of the Minotaur, cattle do seem to have been of great importance to the Minoans. There are numerous depictions of the Minoan pastime of bull leaping. Essentially, this means leaping over a charging bull. This may have been a game, but the practice, and bulls in general, also possibly even had a religious importance. Both men and women are depicted in bull leaping, and while presumably dangerous, bull leaping gone wrong is not depicted in any of the artwork. Minoan religion in general is a mystery. We must work out its contents based off of the symbols, relics, and religious centers across the island that were left behind. There is clear evidence of religious practice, but what and who exactly they worshipped is not known. There seems to be evidence of Near Eastern, again, specifically Egyptian influence, shown by things like the presence of the symbol of the Ankh, an Egyptian hieroglyph representing life. Other prominent symbols include serpents, dolphins, and the labris, or the double-headed axe. The labris is never wielded by males, however, which may indicate that the central deity was a life-giving goddess. The prevalence of depictions of the natural world suggests that the people were highly tied to it. They were one of the first cultures to portray natural landscapes without humans present. The Minoans do not appear to have constructed any grand temples to their gods, and instead had smaller religious centers, some in the palaces, others in caves throughout the countryside. It is possible that some of their gods survived their collapse and were incorporated into the later Greek religion, specifically Pretomartis, the Greek goddess of mountains and hunting who was of great importance to the later Cretans. There is evidence of human sacrifice, including child sacrifice and even cannibalism. The extent of this, however, and its purpose, is not known, but these discoveries seem to date towards the end of Minoan civilization, when people would have been under heavy stress to please the gods and or when starvation may have been a widespread issue, so it may not have been normal. The Minoans seem to have heavily emphasized trade. They ruled over what the later ancient Greeks would call a thalassocracy, or a sea empire. Many of the islands of the Aegean were closely tied to and likely colonized by the Minoans. Minoan influence extended much farther to places like mainland Greece, the Levant, and Egypt as well. In fact, their trade goods have been found as far away as Iberia. It is very difficult to establish which settlements were under Minoan rule and which ones were very active trading partners, but it is clear that the Minoan influence in the Mediterranean world, again, specifically the Aegean, was quite strong. The Minoans seem to have been a fairly self-sufficient people, and appear to have focused on importing raw materials absent from the island and exporting finished goods. One of these raw materials was bronze, the copper and tin alloy which marked the age in which they live, but which they themselves lacked. They would have to be obtained by trading with other areas, namely Cyprus, Anatolia, and possibly the mines in the north of al Karid, if they could evade the scorpions. And yet, despite their powerful influence, there does not appear to have been heavy emphasis on the military. 
There is little documentation of war apart from what mythology claims might have happened, little archaeological evidence of major war, and a noticeably small presence of the military in Minoan artwork. The depictions archaeologists have found of soldiers may have been mostly depictions of rituals, and the weapons they found may have been ceremonial and unfit for combat. Sir Arthur Evans believed this to be a sign of a Pax Minoica, or a long period of peace enjoyed by the people of the island which lasted until the Mycenaean arrival. While the society doesn't seem to have been very militaristic, it is dubious that this was a Mediterranean paradise where conflict was unheard of. The remains of more serious weaponry and some minor fortifications have been found on the island dating to the Minoan Age. Furthermore, though there were no great walls, they may have emphasized using the rough terrain to their advantage when it came to defending themselves, rather than building impressive fortifications. They may also have gotten along quite well on land and emphasized naval defense. If the Minoans did rule over a sea empire, they likely had a powerful navy. You generally don't forge powerful empires by asking your weaker neighbors nicely to join and your powerful rivals to please kindly leave you alone. The Minoans were clearly active and powerful players in the exciting and energetic Bronze Age world, but they were not destined to last forever. Life on this island would change, in some ways quite suddenly, and in others quite slowly. One day, for one reason or another, their strength would begin to fail them, and their ability to sustain their remarkable achievements would diminish, until eventually they disappeared forever. By around 1550 BC, the Minoan civilization appears to have entered a period of decline. The reasons surrounding this decline are as mysterious as everything else surrounding this people. The echoes of the Minoan cries can now only be faintly heard. The destruction and death uncovered by archaeologists and other researchers frozen in time until recently remains a mystery. The reasons for their tragic end perhaps will remain forever unknown. For one reason or another though, the Minoan civilization appears to have come to an end around 1450 BC, with their civilization's influence fading from history in the subsequent centuries in the post-palatial period. Historians look at two main possible causes for their downfall, natural disaster and invasion. The origin of the answer may not lie on Crete itself, but on a small island north of it, today known as Santorini, and in the past as Thera. In the age of the Minoans, a prominent settlement, known to us as Akrotiri, existed on this island. It was quite wealthy, lying in the middle of a number of ancient trade routes. Life here was very likely quite prosperous. However, the island is also home to a volcano. Evidence suggests that sometime in the 16 or 1500s BC, there is debate as there is contradictory data, there was an absolutely massive volcanic eruption, one of the largest recorded in human history. The ancient Egyptians possibly referenced this event. The eruption buried the settlement of Akrotiri, preserving much of it actually, much like Pompeii in ancient Rome. Unlike Pompeii, however, the total lack of human remains suggests an evacuation. The very small amount of gold items discovered in the settlement's remains suggests that this evacuation was perhaps orderly and undertaken in advance. However, where the inhabitants went is unknown. Some researchers believe they might have tried to flee, but not enough boats could have made it in time, and that the remains of thousands may be preserved elsewhere on the island. Much of the rest of the island's surface collapsed and filled with water due to geologic strain placed on it from the eruption, utterly demolishing settlements on the island which may have been even more impressive and populated. A great ancient city which collapses underwater after presumably invoking the wrath of the gods. Could this be the origin of the Atlantis story which Plato wrote about? It is possible, but the association would likely be weak. The problem is that Plato gives it a number of mythical qualities, and makes some points which counter the idea of Atlantis's origins lying on Thera, such as that Atlantis did, in fact, according to him, exist in the Atlantic, beyond the Pillars of Hercules, which are here in Gibraltar and Morocco. 
Plato, who was likely more concerned with writing philosophy than history, and wrote a thousand years after the eruption, probably invented the lion's share of the story, but whether or not the story included a faint, distant memory of this real event is a question still left open. We may never know for sure, unless of course we actually find a sunken ancient city in the Atlantic. Many people have tried, but so far, no luck. The eruption likely would have done damage to the whole Aegean world. Evidence does not show that a high amount of volcanic ash landed on Crete itself, only a small, mostly inconsequential amount, but it may very well have caused a massive tidal wave which struck a large portion of the island. Some have suggested that this wave may have been as much as 100 feet high in some areas of the island. As destructive as this event might have been, it does not seem to be the case that it directly brought the Minoan civilization to an end. There is evidence of the continuation and success of their culture from goods found above the layer of light ash that was mentioned. Interestingly, there seems to have been an explosion in art concerning marine life originating from Canossos, possibly representing the Minoan recognition of the power of the sea and rise in Canossos' influence. The event likely changed the island forever, creating social and political turmoil which would last for decades, though again, how severely it hit the civilization is unknown. The eruption may have struck Minoan society so hard as a whole that it paved the way for other invaders to enter the scene and take over the remaining sites. These would have been the Mycenaeans. The Mycenaeans were the Greeks of the semi-mythical Greek past, the people around whom many legends are based, such as those of the Iliad and the Odyssey. It is quite unlikely that they were united into one kingdom either, but may have embarked on conquests in cooperation with other states, like they are said to have done in the Trojan War. Their civilization came to fruition around 1600 BC on mainland Greece, and by 1450 they were reaching the height of their power and strength. It is known that, sometime in the 1400s, the Mycenaeans came to rule Crete and replaced Minoan civilization there, though whether they invaded the island, or simply practically sailed over and took over a society that was falling apart without much resistance, is not known. Whatever happened, they seem to have done quite a bit of damage. The Mycenaeans, who, judging by their artwork and remains, were much more militaristic, likely took Knossos and ruled from there, adopting much of the local culture. Knossos appears to have been largely spared from whatever devastating conflict was occurring in this time. There is archaeological evidence of destruction found throughout the island disproportionately in this time, which is suggestive of an invasion and overthrow of the old order. It seems that the destroyed sites from this era lack gold and other precious goods, suggesting pillaging. The door for the Mycenaeans to invade Greece was possibly partially opened by the tsunami destroying the Minoan fleet. However, keep in mind, their invasion occurred likely about a generation after the eruption. It is possible that the eruption hit a society which was already experiencing trouble. What is clear is that from the Minoans, the Mycenaeans would learn a large amount, which would be transported back to mainland Greece. It was in this time that the Linear B alphabet, adopted by the Mycenaeans, began to become the dominant writing system on Crete. This is an early form of Greek descended from Linear A. However, though there are a number of similarities between Linear A and B, the Minoan language was likely quite different from this very ancient Mycenaean Greek separate languages using the same alphabet. The last of the Linear A writing remains have been dated to about 1350 BC. Though researchers today can read Linear B, nothing has yet been discovered clearly explaining what happened. After this, the Minoan civilization began to fade out of existence. Its people were assimilated, the legends were lost, and the great works of art and architecture were buried and forgotten. The last refuge of Minoan civilization seems to have been at a site called Carphi, which may have protected various elements of their civilization until as late as 1200 BC. Here they may have held out against the Mycenaeans, or existed as Mycenaean subjects who took refuge there from an even more mysterious group, called the Sea Peoples. After that, they are gone. 
The palatial sites appear to have been abandoned around 1200 BC as well. The Mycenaeans would rule Crete, and Minoan culture was assimilated into theirs. It is said that many soldiers of the Trojan War came from Mycenaean Crete. They too would only have a few centuries of glory, however, and would one day disappear themselves in the 1100s BC in a much more widespread event known as the Bronze Age Collapse. Their epic story will be discussed in a future documentary. Today, despite a century of work, the Minoans remain largely a mystery. This ancient civilization has left us so much, but alas, possibly not enough to truly understand who they were. One day though, perhaps we will uncover something lying hidden on the island which will provide proper elucidation. This is the shortest HNP documentary I have ever done, and may ever do, but I would be happy to make a part 2 if a great new discovery is made one day. Because of the remarkable achievements of this lost civilization, such a discovery could change how we see the entire Bronze Age, and maybe the history of civilization as a whole. Until that day though, we can only wonder. Before we wrap up, I would like to mention the creation of Lucinox, our second YouTube channel where we will cover scientific topics. I have not uploaded any content to it yet, but I plan to soon. I will likely begin with a documentary instead of a trailer, which will be up most likely this month, June. So if you're interested and would like to subscribe to join the channel as it takes off, the link to it will be in the description. By the way, I am not leaving Fire of Learning. Fire of Learning will continue on indefinitely. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, I invite you to come check out the rest of Fire of Learning and to subscribe to see more videos like this in the future. You can help support the production of videos like these by donating to us on Patreon, a link to which is in the description. I'd like to thank our current patrons once again listed here for their support. We are also on Instagram and Twitter, so come check us out there too. This has been a Fire of Learning History of Nations and Peoples documentary. Thank you for watching. So if I were to do a documentary on your nation's history, where would you suggest that I start? Okay, well, um, tell you what, for now we'll hold off on that and we'll do something a little bit more broad on Lucinox, I think.